Good evening. My name is Stephanie Sandoval. I am the Public Archaeology Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I want to welcome you to our very first online event. We have many attendees from around the world. So if you've never been to the Archaeological Center, we are a nonprofit dedicated to the preservation of local archaeological collections. In addition to the state of art um, curation and research facility, we have a museum and focus on providing high quality educational programs for both kids and adults. As you know, it's a challenging time for a lot of us right now. So if you would like to support the center through membership or a donation, please visit our website. Before I introduce our speaker, a few small housekeeping items. For questions, we will be using the Q&A feature. You can find it on your Zoom control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time to the speaker or staff. However, Jillian will answer her questions at the end. Also, if you are only seeing the slides of the screen share and not the presenter's video, please make sure that your viewer is set to full screen. I would like to introduce Jillian Wong. She is a zoo archaeologist and is just wrapping up her PhD at the University of Tübingen in Germany. She came to us earlier this year as a volunteer and has been fantastic with her expertise and enthusiasm. Without further ado, please welcome Jillian Wong. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you to the Archaeological Center for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, like Stephanie said, I'm finishing up my PhD right now. Um, let me share my screen with you guys. Uh, I've been doing archaeology for about 10 years now, um, but my specialty is zooarchaeology. So I mostly work with uh, animal bones and teeth. So today my talk is going to introduce you to what zooarchaeology is and what some of the research questions are that we explore in zooarchaeology. And then it's also going to give you an example of a zooarchaeological project, which is going to be um, my, coming from my PhD project, which explores what past environments look like during the Stone Age in Germany. All right, let's get started. Let me make sure it's changing slides here. One moment, <laughs> I'm telling it to change. Oh, there we go. Okay, if it changes again, it's just slow. All right, so let's start with what is zooarchaeology? Zooarchaeology is the study of animal remains in the archaeological record. And remember that archaeology is the study of the human behavior through things like excavation, so study of past human behavior. So when we set study animal remains to answer archaeological questions, we're studying animal, animal remains to answer questions about the human past. Zooarchaeology goes, goes by many names, not just zooarchaeology. It's also been referred to as archaeozoology, faunal analysis, and this faunal here is just uh, meaning animals, so as in flora and fauna. So you'll hear a lot when um, us archaeologists are talking to each other, someone saying, oh, he's studying the faunal remains from the site, or ah, yes, put those faunal remains over there. That just means put those animal remains over there. There's also archaeological faunal analysis or archaeofaunal analysis. Sometimes osteoarchaeology is used, but that can be a, a little bit confusing because um, it can also refer to human remains, which we don't study. Um, the reason for the variety of names um, there's several reasons. One of them is that zooarchaeology developed out of several disciplines. So early studies of animal remains from archaeological sites were conducted by people like paleontologists or veterinarians, biologists, doctors, um, and several other specialties in fields outside of archaeology. Today, most of us have a background in archaeology. So for example, I did my bachelor's and my master's work in anthropology and now my PhD in archaeology. And so we're trained in archaeology. But um, in the past, a lot of people who've worked with these remains have come from other disciplines. And so that can kind of change the way that the name has evolved historically. It also can vary uh, geographically. For example, here in North America, I find that we usually prefer the term zooarchaeology, but in Europe, archaeozoology is more preferred. Um, it, it can, it basically all is, is uh, 
similar, just maybe with a different history. Now, when I say we study animal remains in the archaeological record, I mean all the parts that come from animals. Um, that can be teeth, it can be ivory, which is part of a tooth, horn and antler, it can be bone, it can be shell, um, it can be fish scales, it can be skin, it can be hide, it can be fur, and it can even be things like baleen, which are these uh, stringy plate-like structures that some whales have to sieve food out of the water. Um, and actually, I experienced working with baleen in my bachelor's when I worked for Dr. Darwin, her Zoar lab. I think she's here with us today. And that was just a really cool uh, intro for me to the variety of remains that we can work with. Um, there is kind of a strong preference when it comes to training for people to study vertebrates, so animals that have backbones, and also shell, especially um, in coastal regions like here in San Diego. Shell can be a very common thing to study. And so there is kind of a preference towards these types of animals. Um, because archaeology deals with remains that have been excavated, and so they, they're, they've been deposited in sediment, sometimes for a very long time, sometimes for a shorter amount of time, what we study really can depend on the preservation. And so the majority of archaeology that I work with, which is generally prehistoric, um, and so often tens of thousands of years old, is uh, bones and teeth, and then sometimes antler and horn remains as well. There's, there's not a lot of other stuff that gets, gets preserved usually, although there are some contexts in which um, almost the entire body can be preserved from things that old. So let's talk about what zooarchaeology doesn't do. Um, we do not study human remains, although humans are animals. Um, there are specialties in which human remains are studied, um, like paleoanthropology, paleo um, biological archaeology, biological anthropologists. These are all people that usually study human remains. Um, and so often, though, what will happen is that archaeological sites, there are both human remains and animal remains. And so a job for um, both specialties, for zooarchaeologists as well as people who study human remains, that's very important, is being able to distinguish human remains from other animals. And that's especially important in countries like the United States that have laws and regulations that are there to protect indigenous remains in the archaeological record, for example, in uh, the US to protect Native American remains. And so we need to make sure that we're not disturbing those types of remains. This is a really important job. Um, so we often are able to at least identify the differences between the two because we do overlap, especially um, if you're someone like me who looks at a lot of mammal skeletons. A human is not too different from a dog. And so we're, we're understanding the differences very easily. Zooarchaeology is also uh, not paleontology and not zoology, although it does borrow a lot of methods from these fields. So paleontology, like zooarchaeology, is the study of animal remains in the fossil record, but without this um, focus on human questions. So we study these animal remains to ask questions about past humans, and they don't, they're not interested in the past humans, but interested in the animals themselves. And zoology um, is the study of modern animals. So like I told you earlier, zooarchaeology has developed um, from many other disciplines, kind of reflecting the fact that archaeology is a very interdisciplinary subject. Um, and as a result, we use methods from paleontology a lot. Uh, I, in fact, one of my mentors for my PhD is a paleontologist. So just reminding you, zooarchaeologists specifically study human use of animals, or the relationship between humans and animals, or animal remains found in archaeological contexts. Because of this, we as zooarchaeologists do not study dinosaurs, because dinosaurs and humans never existed at the same time. So that's paleontologists. Okay, so on this slide and the next slide, I have a big list of some research questions that zooarchaeologists try to address. 
this is not all inclusive. Like I said, archaeology um, is a very broad discipline and it's very interdisciplinary. And this is probably one of the reasons that we have developed specialties over the year, like zooarchaeology, my specialty, or um, geoarchaeology, the study of the geology of archaeological sites, or uh, like I mentioned earlier, paleoanthropology specialties for people who study human remains, because it is broad. Um, and so as we go through these research questions, I'm sure some of you will be able to think of other questions that zooarchaeology can address. Um, and I want you to be thinking about what else, we, <laughs> what else we can address. But these are just some examples. So the first one I have on this slide is human diet reconstruction. This is kind of the traditional zooarchaeology or what um, seems to be uh, what most people think of when they think of zooarchaeology and what a lot of us do, which is reconstruct past diets of humans. Um, and when we do that, we can talk about things like um, butchering. Were these, um, were these animals that people ate butchered? How? What tools were used? Were these animals that humans ate transported? Uh, maybe they were killed in one location and then the people transported them to a different location to cook them. And if they did that, did they take the entire animal with them or did they take only pieces of the animal? We can also talk about game management. Think about modern game management. So um, hunting regulations for specific animals, for deer. Um, are people only hunting males, only hunting females? Are there regulations on that? And how do people choose which species or which age groups, et cetera, to hunt um, in order to ensure that they, for example, have uh, continuous access to food? We can also talk about whether people hunted, did they fish, did they scavenge for food, uh, like getting food from um, animals that had already been killed by other carnivores. Were they herding animals, like herding sheep to create their own food? Another thing we can talk about is biogeography. Um, and biogeography is the study of the geological distribution of a geological, geographic <laughs> distribution of living things. And for example, where I work in Germany, um, I work with a time period that was during the Ice Age. So it was, although today this region is uh, quite forested and very temperate, has a lot of agriculture, in the time period that I work, as, as you'll see soon, it was quite cold and actually reindeer were in the area. And so the archaeological record has a lot of reindeer remains in it because people ate reindeer, they hunted and ate reindeer quite frequently at this time period. And today we don't find reindeer anywhere in Germany, uh, unless I guess if they're uh, on some sort of uh, zoo or something, um, naturally occurring, I should say. And so we can use the archaeological record of animal remains to understand how animal distributions have changed over time and why. We can also talk about human settlement patterns, how people moved across the landscape. Um, a lot of times humans at the time period I study where they're hunting and gathering and they don't have any domestic animals, um, they will sometimes move across the landscape seasonally and never live in one location for a long period of time. And sometimes that seasonal movement can follow the game animals um, that, they're, that they're hunting. We can also talk about human and animal interactions and relationships. And I've put here that this includes the human perception of animal groups. We can think about different ways that people perceive animals. Um, sometimes we get bogged down in zooarchaeology about thinking about just animals as food, and that's not at all the only relationship we have with them. Um, we perceive animals differently in different cultures over different time periods. Uh, for example, I have a dog, and so dogs to me are something that are very personal. They're very much part of the family, and that's not the case in all cultures and, or, or for, um, all of time. We also talk about domestication. This is another uh, topic that's very traditional, like diet reconstruction in zooarchaeology. This is a topic that is, has been studied for a long time um, and was, was and continues to be one of the key questions of zooarchaeological research. 
when did we start domesticating animals? When um, do we see, for example, a genetic change in animals during their domestication? Or um, where were animals, certain animals domesticated? Um, was it different in different locations? The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> things like that. We really want to know how this big change in the relationship between humans and animals occurred. And the last one on this slide is paleoecological reconstruction or reconstructing past paleo ecologies. So the past relationships between animals, between humans, between plants and their environmental surroundings. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today as my example. So I'm not going to go into that one yet. You'll see it in a minute. On this slide, I also uh, talk about, sorry, I'm just moving something out of the way on my screen how animals uh, can also be used as raw material. We can think about that a lot with domestication. Domesticated sheep provide us with wool, they provide us uh, with, with other things to make clothing. They can also provide us animals um, with bones to make tools out of. They can be fuel. So bones can be used as uh, fuel to make fire. This happens often in areas that are not very forested, that are quite cold. Um, I say often, often in these types of areas, not that it happens often. Anyway, cordage. Animals can also uh, be used to make cordage. Their tenons and their sinews um, can be used to create very strong cordage. We can track migration using animals. A good example of how we do this is when people have animals that are following them around. For example, my dog is moving with me everywhere I go. Um, we can see animals introduced into an area that we wouldn't expect them to be in naturally. And that could be a way to track the migration of people across, uh, across space. We also have um, a lot of ability in zooarchaeology to contribute to discussions of human evolution. Uh, two big questions in human evolution are, um, how did hunting uh, begin? So when did we start hunting as opposed to scavenging for food? And as you can imagine, as we studied the animals that were hunted, we have a lot to say about that. And then um, another big topic is um, brain size development associated with meat eating. There is this, um, uh, I guess we could say theory that um, humans have, this is not the theory, so humans have very large brains, that's a fact, um, but there's this theory that possibly one of the reasons we developed such large brains is because we started eating meat. Um, and so how are these two associated with each other? Again, we have a lot that we can contribute to this question. We can also contribute to questions of how humans impact their environment. Uh, we uh, are very aware of this right now, I feel like during this pandemic, um, because we're seeing uh, amazing air quality right now when we're not driving around. But human environment impacts are also the ways humans uh, impact animals and their distributions and whether they go extinct. Um, there's uh, debates and uh, a lot of work going on in North America, for example, um, talking about how and whether humans were involved in the extinction of large animals like mammoths at the end of the ice age and if their hunting of these animals caused them to go extinct or was partially involved or not involved at all we can talk about landscape use that idea you can kind of see in this picture on the right in the middle with someone plowing a field using um uh, what i assume are horses um and the uh, how people change the landscapes around them, and they can use animals to do that, as an example. We can also see the social stratification, that means different levels of people in society, or the accumulation of wealth through animal remains. An example is, um, for example, today we would, maybe if someone's eating a lot of lobster, it's very expensive food, it's very high-end food, and we can compare that to maybe someone who's eating less expensive meats, less expensive animals, um, because they don't have the money to be eating these high-end things. So that's an example of how we can see these differences in um, wealth or um, your social status. 
And finally on here, I have ritual use of animals. And, and that includes religious and cult practices. There are several religions, cults, um, rituals that involve animals. And even today, we can think of some examples of, um, for example, kosher or halal diets um, that have uh, certain rules or regulations about what animals can be eaten or what parts of the animal can be eaten. And so zooarchaeology so can um, help us identify sometimes this ritual behavior in the past. Okay, again, the slide is going a little slow to change, so just hang with me here. Let's try it again. Still trying. I have found when I was practicing that if you click it too much, it will <laughs> just go to, ah, there we go, okay. Then it goes like three slides ahead and that's no good. <laughs> okay, so now that I've given you an intro into what we do as zooarchaeologists, um, I'm gonna now move on to the example of a research project I'm doing for my PhD. And for this research project, I'm reconstructing paleo environments, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm using animal remains to understand what past environments looked like. And when we reconstruct past environments in zooarchaeology and in archaeology in general, because you can do this um, with more than just animal remains, um, we're asking questions like, what was the relationship between humans and their environment in the past? Or how did the environment shape how humans moved across the landscape or what they ate or how they got their food? These are some questions that uh, we want to know. Um, between humans and their, their environments. So before I um, start on the, the research, I just want to um, mention, I'm going to define environment, but first I'm going to mention that there is um, a viewpoint in the study of past environments and, and in archaeology that environments exclusively determine human behavior and that human decisions are based exclusively on environmental conditions. Um, for those archaeologists watching, this is often confused with um, environmental ecology, which is not what environmental ecology means. Um, this is called environmental determinism, and this is not really how I view my research at all. So, of course, um, because environments are the context in which humans find themselves um, every day, they are very important in human decision making. Uh, they, of course, impact where people live, um, for example, what they eat, um, what kind of activities they can participate in. But there are a lot of other factors influencing that human behavior, especially cultural factors and social factors that are influencing human decision making and behaviors. So remember that we're not uh, pushing people into a certain way that they have to live based on their environment. We're just understanding the context in which these decisions are made. And so this is just one factor in human behavior and human decision making. Um, I've going to define environment for you here, um, just as a reminder, because um, there's uh, sometimes I get questions about the differences between environment, climate, weather, etc. So when I say environment, I'm talking about the surroundings or conditions in which a person, animal, or plant lives or operates. So for me in archaeology, I'm talking about the surroundings and conditions in which a human lives and operates. So some examples might be, uh, are these people living in forests? Are they um, sometimes moving into grassland areas? Oh yes, but they, uh, this area is very dry at this time. Or this is a steppe, or this is a tundra region. And steppe and tundra are types of vegetation. My favorite example of uh, environments in archeology span comes from Mesa Verde, which is in the Southwest in the US. Um, in Mesa Verde is uh, very famous for his prehistoric structures. You can see some in this photo here that are built into cliffs. And the interesting thing is that prehistoric peoples in this region, um, and, and historic as well actually, excuse me, were using three environmental zones. So in this photo, you can see in the bottom right, the photo, I don't know if that actually is going the way you guys, <laughs> the way I think it's going. <laughs> 
how I'm reflected. Anyway, just imagine in the bottom right of the photo, you can see more um, brush, more vegetation. That's the river valley bottom. And down there, there's more trees. There's a lot of animals down there. And people are hunting down in the river valleys. Then in this next environmental zone, which is the cliff face itself, people are living and storing food. So this is where these structures are built. And then on the top of the cliff is where people are doing agriculture. And this area, as you can see, it's not, um, not as wet as down below. So it doesn't have such a diversity of animal, animals up there. So there's kind of three environmental zones within, you know, few hundred feet of each other that people are exploiting. And this is an example of how dynamic humans are when they interact with their environments. Okay, so in zooarchaeology, we of course want to know how animals can tell us about past environments. We cannot measure the temperature directly from the past with a thermometer. Um, we can take almost, there's almost no way, there are some ways, there are almost no way to take a direct measurement of past environmental conditions. And so instead what we use is what we call proxy data. And by proxy, what I mean are um, information from other sources that have implications for what the past environment would have been like, but cannot tell us absolutely for certain it was five degrees Celsius. An example is animals. So we know, for example, that uh, polar bears need a specific um, condition. We're seeing that a lot right now with climate change, that um, polar bears need Arctic environments, they need ice sheets in order to survive. And so if we find polar bear remains, we can make kind of a, a hypothesis about what the environments were, that it was very cold and similar to today's Arctic, perhaps. Also, conversely, if we find this guy on the bottom left, this is the desert wood rat from, this is actually from some of my master's research. Um, the desert wood rat is specifically adapted to very dry and open conditions. He doesn't need, um, he or she, does not need any uh, water besides the water that they get from their food. And so if we find a desert wood rat, we can kind of make an assumption or a hypothesis that the past was very dry. Now, this uh, proxy, this way of reconstructing past environments is called the indicator taxa method. And so that's indicator taxa. Taxa is a word that we use to describe an animal category within scientific naming for animals, like they use in biology. An example of that is homo sapiens, humans. So that's a taxon, which is the singular of taxa. So you can think when I say indicator taxa, you can think of that being um, indicator animals. Um, so we call these guys like polar bears and desert wood rats, indicator taxa. This is the most fundamental um, use of animal remains for reconstructing past environments, the indicator taxa method. Now you can imagine that some animals are better at this than others. Uh, think about pigs, for example. Although they are my favorite animal, they are terrible for uh, reconstructing past environments because pigs have adapted to almost every continent. They live on almost every continent and are found in almost every environmental context in the world. And as a result, they give us no information. <laughs> um, what do give us really good, very specific information are small animals and I call these guys microfauna, very small animals. So you'll hear me say microfauna a lot. And when I say microfauna, what I'm referring to are amphibians, reptiles, fish. I know some fish can get big, but fish. I'm also referring to rodents and then um, some insectivores like shrews or moles, sometimes bats as well. These small little guys, they live in um, mostly small areas. Um, I mean, a lot smaller than think about reindeers. They're migrating hundreds of miles in one year. So a mouse is not living in hundreds of mile migration routes. <laughs> um, they're living in smaller areas. So generally these types of animals reflect the environmental conditions very locally compared to other animals. Um, and 
also, I, so I mostly study rodents. That's mostly what, what I work with. Rodents, for example, they have very short lifespans um, relative to other mammals. They produce a lot of young. They have large, large litters. And um, they reproduce very frequently. So as a result of this very short life history that they have and this very rapid and dynamic life history, they respond to environmental change very quickly. And there are studies that show with um, modern remains that they actually reflect the environmental changes at the decadal level. So every 10 years or so, which in archaeology is just incredible resolution. Uh, and and uh, with my master's work, we were able to discover that at, at the minimum, they're showing um, changes in the environment at 100 year intervals, which is Again, in the archaeological record for the time periods I work in, in prehistory and the Stone Age, this is an incredible amount of resolution. So there are, just like the polar bear and the desert wood rat, there are other rodents that are good at showing us what types of environments there are. Um, the red-backed vole is very good um, for indicating that an environment was very forested. And the collared lemming on the bottom here holding his his little food like this, um, <laughs> is very good for indicating steppe vegetation, tundra vegetation, and Arctic environments, are regions similar to the Arctic today. Um, one thing I'm going to mention about these, this microfauna is that it's usually in archaeological sites, almost, excuse me, almost always, um, in archaeological sites as a result of um, non-human activity. Um, this is not always the case for, for fish. Fish are often hunted. Maybe the smaller ones are, are getting there um, by non-human activity, but these big ones usually people are putting there. What, how they're arriving at these sites is usually through other animals like predatory birds, such as owls or hawks or raptors. Um, and or uh, small carnivores like foxes. And they come there as the meal of these animals. So for example, um, owls can perch in caves or on uh, rock overhangs and to eat their, their meal, maybe a rodent. So they're, maybe they're eating this red-backed vole. And as they're eating, maybe pieces are falling down below underneath the rock overhang. Um, or after they're done with their meal, they cough up a pellet and it falls down underneath the rock overhang. Now birds, uh, small mammals like foxes, all these animals like to use similar places that humans like to use, places with shelter, places that are a good place to take a break, eat your meal and be safe. Caves, rock shelters, other things. Um, and so usually what we have is human activity occurring and then also these microfauna being put in at the same time. So we have a good indicator of the environment mixed with human activity. So they're directly connected. Okay, so I talked about the indicator taxa method earlier. We're gonna get more detail now. We're gonna talk about the building upon the indicator taxa methods that's been done. This has specifically been done probably in the past 15 years or so. Um, a lot of methods have been developed specifically with statistical modeling. That's what, that's what um, a method I use uses to build upon that indicator taxa approach. So instead of saying, ah, oh, there were polar bears, it was very cold. Now we can quantify, ah, oh, there were polar bears and these other species, it was probably between negative five degrees and five degrees Celsius in the winter. And the way this specific model that I use works, this model is called the bioclimatic analysis, is the original developer of this model um, took modern information from specific locations, several of them throughout the world, um, including my hometown of Fresno. So uh, that's in California, for those of you uh, not from the area. So took Fresno, California, the city I grew up in, and he said, what animals, what mammals currently live in that area? And he made a list. And then he said, what are the specific environmental conditions in that area? Um, and he had uh, specific environmental variables he was interested in. What was the temperature, the average temperature throughout the year? How much rain does this location get per year? He had several of these. And then he tried to create a model that took those, that list of mammal species and used it to predict those environmental conditions. 
he was very successful. There are several of them. Um, and so now in archaeology, what I can do is I can take my list of animals at the site, plug it into my statistical model in the computer here, and then I can get out those specific environmental conditions. This is a lot of stats, a lot of math. That's as deep as I'm going into it for now. Um, and you'll notice this depends on me being able to take remains of these animals that I found in the archaeological record and identifying them and knowing what animal they belong to. So when I get these, these animal remains, they look like this, these photos on the left here. Oh, sorry. I clicked. Um, and this on the bottom left is a molar from a vole, which is a type of rodent. Actually, in, in German, it's, uh, they call them mice, but they're actually, in English, we call them voles. A little confusing if you work in Germany and have to speak both languages. <laughs> Notice in this picture of this molar, of this tooth, there is a scale at the bottom here. This white line is 0 0.5 millimeters long in this photo. So imagine how small this tooth is. It's less than a centimeter long. And then this photo up here at the top, this guy is three upper molars from a mouse, not a bull, a mouse, in the upper jaw still. And so again, notice the scale here. And I have to be able to take those and say what animal they belong to. In order to do this, I use uh, two kind of source material. First, I use many published articles, books, uh, monographs that have uh, identification guides in them for what teeth or bones look like for a specific animal versus others. I also use what are called comparative collections. These are usually housed in archaeological departments or anthropological departments. They're housed in natural history museums, in scientific museums, in biology departments, in zoology departments. And what they are is a museum collection of animal skeletons or um, animal remains, sometimes also the skin, the fur, the horns, the antler, um, important parts of the body that we need to identify the animals. So what I do when I'm looking at these teeth under a microscope is I have next to me several skeletons of, of rodents. And I can compare the teeth in those modern skeletons from our collection to the ones from the archaeological record and say, okay, this one has characteristics that are closest to this rodent. Um, and once I've done that, I can say that this tooth is a narrow-headed vole and or belong to a narrow-headed vole in the past. And these teeth belong to a yellow-necked mouse in the past. And I do that with all of my remains. Of course, we can't identify everything. We, we can't identify most of it. That is a common misconception. <laughs> we, you know, a lot of it we're, we're not able to identify. The ones that we can identify to a specific uh, group, a species, or perhaps a family, yes, that was a duck. We just don't know which one. Then what I can do with that is have a list of those species, plug it into my statistical models, and get my environmental conditions. All right, now let's look at the location that I do this with. That was very methods heavy, but I kind of wanted to use that to give you an idea of what we're doing in zoo archaeology. Um, this is a map of uh, the region I work in for my PhD. This is in southwestern Germany. Note this uh, map of Germany up here on the left is telling you where we are. We're in this uh, red rectangle here in this map. This region here, this orange region, orange indicating that it's at a higher elevation than the other region, so it's quite hilly region, is called the Swabian Jura. And the Swabian Jura is a big karstic system. That means it's limestone. And it is running along the Danube River. Follow my indicator here. This blue line is the Danube River. And the Danube River in Germany, just to give you an idea, if you're not as familiar with German geography, is so to the right of this Danube River in Germany is Bavaria. And then on the other side of the Danube River is the German state Baden-Württemberg. And my site is in one of the many river valleys in the Swabian Jura that are offshoots of the Danube itself. So it's in the Lona River Valley, which is here. Um, and notice Lona 
The word is here. Uh, this is not the Lone Valley. In German, you pronounce all of the letters, so it's the Lona. And the site is called Langmadhalda. Uh, again, we're pronouncing the E at the end. Langmadhalda is a difficult name to say in German and English. <laughs> Uh, and it's kind of a joke among all of us who work there <laughs> because it is a difficult name to say. <laughs> and we are the only ones who know how to spell it <laughs> just because we spell it a lot. This is a picture of the valley that I took on excavation a couple years ago. So you can see that the site is what's called a rock shelter. That's where we have a large outcropping. And then the, this outcrop acts as a shelter area or kind of it has an overhang usually um, for where people like to live because it's very sheltered. Here's that rock outcrop here that this yellow arrow is pointing to. You can barely see it in the trees. And then down here, you can barely see it. It's right, I'm putting my red indicator on it. Um, this is the riverbed of the Lona. It is dry today. There's no water in there in this in this part of the, the Lona. Um, so you can't see it very well. Sometimes this uh, causes problems when people try to drive their cars across the field and almost go down in. Uh, <laughs> you should always get directions from us before you visit us. <laughs> um, this excavation is led by this man here in the middle sitting down. This is Professor Nicholas Connard. He is my PhD advisor. He is my boss. Um, and he leads the Department of Archaeological Sciences at the University of Tübingen. In this photo, this is from last year's excavation, I believe, and he is talking to our two archaeological technicians about the geology of the site. Here is the site um, during excavation last year. They are actually starting excavations this year, next week, with very strict safety protocol um, to ensure that it's safe for everybody working there. Um, and obviously I will not be able to attend because it's in Germany and uh, it's not allowed to travel into Germany at the moment from anywhere outside of the EU. So I'm very sad, but I have been promised a lot of pictures. <laughs> I also don't think the directors would allow me to go right now because it's not very safe, but um, I like to imagine I can be there with them. So here we are excavating last year. Let me just point out at Langmatalda this line here on the rock shelter. So this is that rock outcrop on the left. This line that you can see where the, the rock changes different color, this is where at the top here, this is where the sediment was when we started. Um, and we started in 2016 um, and have excavated every year. Um, and then to the right, as we go to the right of this picture, we're heading towards the valley and it kind of slopes down into the valley. Okay, so this site is um, the the parts of this site that I study and that I'm most interested in are about 15,000 years old. And based on the artifacts in that part of the site, it belongs to the Magdalenian culture of the Stone Age. And when I'm talking about parts of the site, what I'm talking about is horizontal parts. So not parts like this, parts in this way. So I'm talking about different layers, um, different time periods. So when we're at the top of the site, we have the most recent time periods. And as we get deeper into the site, we have the oldest time periods. So I'm talking about time periods horizontally that are Magdalenian. The Magdalenian is at the end of the Stone Age. It's one of the later cultures in the Stone Age. Just a reminder here, I put that the Stone Age uh, we call the Paleolithic. So it's, uh, for, for those who are familiar, it's part of the Upper Paleolithic. Um, during this time period, people are hunting and gathering their food. They're moving across the landscape seasonally. They're using stone tools. And most research into past environments from this area, the Swabian era, as well as Central Europe in general, has suggested that this is a period of very cold, dry conditions that have tundra-like vegetation, like today's Arctic regions. So I've put on here at the bottom a photo of today's Arctic and this tundra vegetation. Notice that it's quite old looking. Um, the vegetation is very small and scrubby, very uh, low to the ground. Um, it's not very dense. So research questions I had when looking at the microfauna from this assemblage was, what were the local conditions like in the Lona Valley? during the Magdalenian? Were they 
different in the Lona Valley or was it similar to the today's Arctic? We know today that um, only a couple miles or kilometers can change what the environment looks like. If you're local to San Diego, think about the difference in environmental conditions we have on the coast. And then, you know, as you head east into the desert, it's a very short distance. And it's definitely a distance that Magdalenian peepers were traveling regularly in their seasonal movements. Um, this, is, this is very different. So I'm interested to know, what was the variation involved? Here is a picture of the microfauna from the site. Um, so these are primarily in this photo rodent bones, some insectivores as well. And when I say that, what I'm talking about are molds and shrews. Um, so they, these are, what I'm doing in this photo is these are all the bones and teeth um, from the site or from a part of the site. <laughs> this is, there is, probably at least half a million specimens that I could work with. So this is a very small amount. So these are the bones and teeth. And then what I'm doing is sorting them. So I'm pulling out the teeth specifically here. And the reason I'm doing that is because the teeth are the easiest and, and sometimes the only part of the skeleton that we can identify um, to a specific animal, to a specific species. Um, of most of the other bones, not so much. With moles, um, and sometimes shrews as well, for different reasons. Um, with moles, you can, with their forelimb, so with their front limb, or in humans, the arm, you can see with those bones, different uh, shapes in the bones, because moles dig with their front limbs, and they have to be very strong. And so they're designed differently. They're very short, they're very stocky, and sometimes they have a little more flair to them. So we can tell, tell that species, those species sometimes, with things other than the teeth. Again, notice how small they are. I have a ruler down at the bottom, centimeters and inches, so everyone will understand. <laughs> um, but just, just think about how small these are. My microfauna and the study of it is kind of a, a specialty within a specialty a little bit. Um, simply, uh, because what I mean with that actually is that it's a specialty within zooarchaeology, and zooarchaeology is a specialty in archaeology. And, and so one of the reasons, just, just from my perspective, that that is, is that um, for most of us trained in zooarchaeology, working with these very small remains, it's, it's familiar. These animals have a similar body plan to other animals. Um, but it's, it's a little bit daunting to work with such large sample sizes. Um, to work with animals where you can only identify them from their teeth most of the time, and with specimens that you have to work with almost entirely under the microscope. So these are kind of uh, reasons, at least from my perspective, why a lot of people don't study microfauna and why it's kind of a very small world, <laughs> the microfauna thing. You, you kind of end up knowing everybody, which is very fun, actually. Okay, I'm very proud of this figure. It took me a very long time to make. Um, this is a picture of some examples of specimens that I have identified to a specific animal, to a specific species in the case of all of these. I'm saying that like it's a big deal because like I said before, sometimes we can only tell it's a duck, we just don't know which one. These ones, we can tell the species. Um, so on the top row, we have all teeth. Um, these are again molars. These are all lower first molars, if you're interested, of voles. Then we have on the bottom left another tooth, another tooth, also molars. And then you've seen this picture before. These are those three upper molars still in the jaw. And we have here several premolars, and that's uh, between your front teeth and your canines, and your molars. So it's we're called, uh, like for example, in um, at your dentist, premolars are your bicuspids. Um, so this is premolars and molars in the jaw. And the last thing we have here, this is the humerus, the upper arm bone of a mole. So it's very wide, it's short. It's broken at the top, but it's short and it has some flair. So these are things that I was able to identify at the species level. And these are some examples of what they look like. Again, notice the scales. This one here is 0 0.5 millimeters. These are very small. But this guy, this humerus, the scale is 5 millimeters, so 10 times bigger. 
So think about how much bigger this guy is than the rest of the things on the screen. Also notice what I have in this, in this figure, this is a figure from, the publica from my publication. And so I don't put their common name here. For example, here, I don't put common and field vole. I put Microtus arvalis agrestis. And that's because in zooarchaeology, we used biological nomenclature. So we use species names that biologists use. And we try to keep up with that as much as possible so that everything's connected. Again, very interdisciplinary. OK, let's look at the data. Um, first, let me just talk about how this graph is oriented. So these are my results. On the y-axis here, we have whatever environmental condition I'm reconstructing. In this case, it's temperature. And I have it in Celsius because in science, we use the metric system. Remember, zero in Celsius for those uh, American, zero is freezing. And uh, 16 degrees, which is right here, is about 61 degrees Fahrenheit. On the bottom, in the y-axis, this will not change. This will stay the same for all the graphs, um, uh, is the layer. So this is the geological layer, those horizontal layers. So like I said, the ones at the top, those are the youngest, the most recent. The ones at the bottom, those are the oldest. And so I have that labeled for you here. So on the left, we have the youngest. So when you see GH2, that's the youngest. And on the right, I've written oldest for you. So GH6 sub layer three, I know that is long, but uh, we have to name them. <laughs> so this one is the oldest. And what I've done is I've put this purple line here for you. This purple line differentiates from the more recent um, layers and the ones from the Magdalenian or the Stone Age. So focus on these ones in this gray square. Those are the ones I'm really interested in. Those are the Magdalenian ones. Okay, on this figure, like I said, we have temperature. We have three lines. The top line, mean temperature of the warmest month. Think of this as the warmest time during the summer. So this is kind of the hottest you're gonna get. On the bottom, we have the opposite, the mean temperature of the coldest month. So think of this as the coldest you're gonna get, the coldest part of winter. In the middle, we have the mean annual temperature or the average yearly temperature. Surprise, it is between the two. <laughs> um, and what you can see is it changes over time. It, you know, each horizon is a little bit different. Some are the same, but they're kind of generally in the same, in the same um, range. We got a, a little bit of something funny happening here in GH3. I can talk about that if you want to. Um, now, what I've done is I've compared that to the temperatures from the modern Arctic. So here's the mean temperature of the warmest month from the modern Arctic. This is its range here in orange. And you'll notice the ones we reconstructed from Langmathalda, they're a little bit warmer, um, but they're still within that range generally. So I, I basically uh, come to the conclusion that they're similar to today's Arctic. Now, the difference really comes in these colder temperatures in the winter months. That, this blue line at the bottom, this blue square at the bottom, this is the mean temperature of the coldest month in the modern Arctic. It's about negative 34 degrees Celsius, so it's quite low. It's, it's not even on the graph. So actually what I'm reconstructing for Langmathalda during the Magdalenian is warmer winters. Okay, now we're gonna look at one other thing that I reconstructed, which is precipitation. So again, on the x-axis, we have those layers, those time periods. And then on the y-axis this time, what I have is millimeters. And this is the millimeters of precipitation every year, so for one year. And uh, this is not just rain, it's also snow melt. So all the water coming into an area. Um, and as you can see, it's varying between about 800 millimeters and a little over 1,000 millimeters per year for this time period for the Magdalenian. Let's check out what the modern Arctic looks like. So the annual precipitation in the modern tundra, remember Arctics have tundra vegetation. So in order to create that type of vegetative environment, it's usually 150 to 250 millimeters. That's much less than we're seeing with the Magdalenian. And so we see um, uh, warmer winters and 
more precipitation during the Magdalenian than the modern Arctic. Let's sum this up. Like I said, more precipitation, warmer winter, warmer winter temperatures, and um, I actually reconstructed something like nine uh, climatic variables. So another one that I found really interesting was that the growing season was a lot longer for um, the ones I reconstructed from Langmanhalde than in the modern Arctic. And so more time for vegetation to grow. Um, and the growing season is measured in months. So what does this mean for those humans living at Langmanhalde during the Magdalenian? Here are our results, those three that we just found. And now what that seems to indicate to us, um, I'm saying us because this is um, a study that I published with um, several colleagues, indicates that there are patches of trees and other vegetation in the area. Remember that picture of the tundra that I showed you before. And now begin to imagine that with patches of trees, denser vegetation, uh, less scrubby, um, more vascular vegetation, which means vegetation with leaves. Um, because with more water, trees are able to grow. That's actually one of the main reason trees do not grow in the Arctic. Um, with longer growing season, that gives vegetation a longer time to expand. Actually, this is uh, what it looks like between environmental zones. So between um, the tundra in the Arctic and as you head into boreal forests, kind of the transition area between these two environmental zones today looks like this. It has a very patchy environment. So what that means probably is that there's a greater diversity of plants and animals on the landscape than we previously expected when we thought about this area as Arctic or as tundra. And so that means that there are more animals because there's different types of plants available to them, uh, different things to eat, different places to live. And that means there's more plants and animals, there's more resources for humans, and uh, there's more things that they can use. Um, in my research, I just wanna give you a quick couple sentences before I end here. In my research, we're using this idea of greater diversity on the landscape, plants and animals, to talk about why people during the Magdalenian would choose this place to stay, to live, um, and why this would be a beneficial region to live in for them. Because this is a time period when people are um, moving into the area, um, because the time period before was uh, most people, no, almost nobody lived in, in this area um, for, for several thousand years before this culture entered. Okay, so that is the end of my talk. Um, before we, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just have some water. Um, before we move on to the question, so I'm gonna um, lead that, um, and then Stephanie will step in if she needs to. But um, I just want to mention um, that funding for this research was provided by the Sengenberg Institu Institute, um, the city of Niederstotzingen, which is the city that we live in during excavation, um, the state of Baden-Württemberg funded my PhD, and then the um, Association for Ice Site Art, uh, excuse me, I'm like half German, half English right now, the Association for uh, Ice Age art in the Lona Valley. <laughs> I'm trying to say it in German. Also provided funding. If you have questions for me, I'm going to start answering them. But if I don't get to your question or if you want to know more, feel free to email me. My email is on the slide. You can follow me on Twitter. You can message me on Twitter. Um, my uh, handle is there. It's very easy to remember. It is simply my name, Jillian L. Wong. <laughs> you can also contact I'm trying to change the slide again and it is not. Come on. I have, ha, okay. So you can also contact the San Diego Archaeological Center if you have questions. Um, if you have questions for me, if you have questions for them. Here is their website. I'd like to remind you that archaeology plays a really important role in the preservation of our shared human past and of past cultures including our own, including the people that 
lived here before we settlers arrived. And especially the San Diego Archaeological Center works to preserve a lot of our past. So if you're able to support them financially, potentially, um, please follow this QR code, go to their website, donate if you can. Um, you can also help them by volunteering your time. If you're local to the San Diego area, I can absolutely recommend volunteering there. As Stephanie said, I started volunteering when I moved to the area. Um, the people are absolutely fantastic to work with. And the center itself is doing really important work. They have a really cool volunteer program and they are really willing to teach you anything you want to know. Um, and you can also support them by following them on social media. They have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Twitter. They are on all the things. <laughs> so please support them if you're able to. Okay, I am going to open this question and answer. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna start at the top, I think. So I have one here that says, hi, were our ancestors primarily meat eaters? What did we mainly eat? Thanks. Ooh, this is a big question. I mean, we could give about a entire uh, school year on this topic. This is a good question. <laughs> um, our ancestors, it, it depends on which ancestors we're talking about because there are several human ancestors. Um, some of them were primarily meat eaters. And actually, um, this is a really cool question because this is a big question in anthropology. We really want to know what people were eating. Um, like, like I said, one of the reasons is for this discussion of brain size. Um, and we really want to know how their morphology, especially of their skull and jaw and teeth, is related to whether they were meat eaters or eating primarily other things. Um, because mostly what we find are remains of the body, or of the, of the skeleton. And so we want to be able to use those to interpret past diets. Um, and so this is kind of a big question. And I'm sorry, that is my answer. I mean, yes, some of our ancestors did primarily eat early humans, so not our ancestors, but us ourselves, um, seem to have had a large amount of meat in our diet. But the cool thing is that um, a lot of archaeology in the past focused on the meat eating. It's easy to recognize in the archaeological record. Um, it's very easy to see game, like deer, like horse, uh, uh, having cut marks from butchery on them, having clear evidence that they've been eaten, that they've been butchered, that they've been hunted. So it's very easy to see evidence of hunting, especially in, in human, when we're talking about humans, not just our ancestors. But studies now are starting to show that humans themselves and our ancestors as well, such as Neanderthals, actually ate um, a lot more fish, a lot more plants than kind of we originally talked about. And this is a really big deal. Recently, some more work came out with Neanderthals eating a lot more seafood. Um, I think it was shellfish. I don't know. I don't actually remember. It's very recent. Um, and so we're, we're beginning to realize something that we probably should have realized a long time ago, which is humans and our ancestors didn't just eat meat. We ate a lot of variety. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm reading. Hmm. I have one from my mom. I'm sorry, everyone else. I'm gonna read that one really quick. It says, how can you know the environmental conditions over such a large range or area if you're only studying a small area at your excavation? Mom, good question. Um, so like I talked about with these um, microfauna, they're, they're at a more local um, area. So it's a smaller area. But how do we, um, sorry, I'm making sure that I mark that I read that one. How do we know how small that area was? Um, we know how small that area was. Um, we can only uh, guess, actually, how locally this environmental condition was. Because these microfauna are coming to the site as a result of predators, non-human predators, like birds, like foxes, bringing them there. And so what we can do is we can reconstruct 
um, what animals we think likely brought them there. This can be done by what is called the study of taphonomy or the study of um, how uh, changes that occur to remains in the record after, they've, after the animal has died. So this can be things like how did the bones break? Um, how did the digestion in the stomachs of the animal that ate these, these um, guys, how did that stomach acid wear down the bones and the teeth to what extent? Extent. So if it's in the stomach for longer, it's uh, exposed to acid for longer, and this it wears them down more. Um, and different avian predators, different mammalian predators, they leave different types of marks on their assemblage. They also eat different things, so based on what species are there. We can do this study, look at the changes, the taphonomy in those microfaunal remains, look at what species are present, and then using what we know about these modern predators today, decide which ones likely put them there. So for example, in my PhD, it's, it's like owls, like all of the owls <laughs> are possible. Um, and what that means is I can look at all those different owl species and I could say, okay, this owl has the largest hunting range today. He hunts over 70 kilometers squared. That's his hunting range. So we guess that this owl, these owls found at most took this, uh, this, these animals from within 70 kilometers squared of the site. That is the best way for us to decide kind of how big or small it is. Um, when we're talking about indicator taxa that are larger, that's, that's a lot more difficult, like things like reindeer that are moving over um, hundreds of miles, hundreds, uh, yeah, hundreds of miles every year um, are at a different kind of spatial scale. Um, and it's a big question as to how to do that. And it varies by species that we use. Um, ah, I have one that is a rodent humor, humorous, normally very distinctive at the species level. Indeed, it is not. Uh, <laughs> so moles, yes. Insectivores, uh, sometimes, yeah, as well, just because they're, they're a little different. Um, so moles. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, shrews, yes, that's what I meant to say instead of insectivore. So shrews sometimes, other, other insectivores, bats, absolutely. Bats, because their arms are their wings, so their bones are very long and extended, um, but, but not, not rodents, unfortunately. <laughs> um, do you correlate your faunal results with paleontological studies in that area? And what this question is asking with paleontological studies is um, studies of pollen or plant remains in the archeological record. Uh, I would love to, a yes and no. This region is a karstic region. <clears throat> and as it's a karstic region, it means that basically the entire landscape is dotted with limestone. And there are no places to get things like lake cores um, that are close by, that are in the Swabian Europe. The closest one, oh, is it from the Bergsy? I think it's from the Bergsy, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so it's, it's outside of the Swabian Jura, so it's not as local as I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, explore, but it does give a good idea of a pretty close area, but it's a challenge actually. I would love to have more of that data to compare with. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is another way that we can reconstruct past environments. If we see certain plant remains like pollen in the archeological record, um, specialists can identify what plants those came from and they can say, okay, this comes from this part of the site, this time period then, there were these types of trees, these types of plants. It is so useful to use this in conjunction with animal remains. Really useful. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have seen many subfields of anthropology that have been adapted for environmental and social activism. Yes, we have, I like. Uh, do you see a future where zooarchaeology becomes more predominant in such activism. Gosh, I hope so. Um, yeah, gosh, I hope so. Um, one, there, there are several ways that anthropology can contribute to environmental and social activism. 
Um, one of the ways that I see archaeology contributing to environmental activism that I think um, maybe some people wouldn't originally um, think about is in our strategies for excavation. Excavation can be very um, detrimental to the environment. And in my opinion, and the opinion of many um, scholars today, we should only be excavating when we have a specific research question in mind, when this research question cannot be addressed with um, other uh, data sets that we already have. There are a lot of data sets sitting in curation facilities. The San Diego Archaeological Center can vouch for that. Um, uh, when appropriate groups have been consulted, for example, indigenous groups um, whose land we are on need to be consulted, etc. And so uh, archaeology in general should definitely be pushing towards answer these environmental activism and social activism uh, uh, problems. Um, Zooarchaeology itself has a lot of potential for helping environmental activism. We are studying the way that past humans affected animal distributions, affected um, the way animals were living, and we can use that information to project the future and how uh, animals will respond to climate change, will respond to humans moving into their areas. And that's important. Um, it's also why, one of the reasons why I find this paleoenvironmental can reconstruction to be so useful. In my master's work, what we really were looking at was um, how El Nino in, um, in Baja, California of Mexico affected the rodent populations. And you could really clearly track El Nino events in the record using specific rodent species. Um, and that has a lot of implications today for how El Nino, as it changes um, because of uh, climate change, will impact animal species in the region. And so I think the tough part for archeologists and something that I struggle with as well, is how do we move our research into the activism sphere? Um, a lot of us will publish it, say that project is done, or okay, now I need to take the next step of that research project. But what we also need to do is be writing for the public, be ensuring that our, the public sees our work and that we're, we're gearing our work to the public and saying, so environments during the Magdalenian were like this. And then taking the next step and saying, that means this for our future. This is what I understand. Um, I hope that answered your question. I don't want to go on a, a soapbox spiel, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> but what a great question. Um, can the assessment of faunal remains determine preferential times of the year for human movement? Preferential times for human movement. I'm trying to think. Preferential times for human movement. I mean, the only reason I'm pausing with this question is just that um, it's hard to decide what was preferential for past people um, just because we didn't live then. I mean, I guess we can say um, if the environments, like, I, like in my study, were more diverse than we expected, possibly it means that people are more secure in getting resources like food. Um, so maybe that can be reflected. Um, we could also potentially answer this question. Um, we can see, forgive me if I'm not answering your question uh, specifically enough, um, but we can also see um, if people start to hunt young animals, for example, uh, young deer or very old animals, um, we can begin to think that maybe there are not, there's not good meat available um, because young individuals don't provide a lot of meat. Old individuals provide not as much meat and doesn't taste very good. Although, you know, sometimes young individuals taste better and we're yeah. hunting them for a different reason. Um, but this has been used, in, used to um, talk about whether animal herds in the region are um, not as fit 
they're not as strong. And so maybe that would be kind of a time to move because the gain isn't preferential. Um, that, that's what I was thinking with that answer. Um, let, me, let me scroll up. How did you find the shift from paleoenvironmental research in the Great Basin to Germany as an academic? Woo! <laughs> One of my old mentors asked that question. Oh my gosh. Well, Chris, let me tell you, that was tough actually. Um, in terms of um, the tough part was not the, um, the change in, in method, because I do use a slightly different method in my master's than I used in my PhD. Um, that, that was expected because I wanted to change method. <laughs> the tough part was learning the new animals. So it was, it was difficult, uh, first of all, to learn what these new species look like, and that took a lot of time. Um, and then just as an academic in general, moving um, from one place to the other was a little bit challenging. It's a different academic culture in Germany than in the US. So it was a learning curve. I had kind of a faux pas at the beginning with my PhD advisor, Professor Connor, um, in an email I sent him um, just, just because I was um, used to the cultural system in uh, the US and I didn't realize I had made a mistake and kind of disrespected him. Um, Luckily, he um, is American and has just been living in Germany for many decades and so actually understood this, this uh, cultural issue. Um, also, maybe what this question is asking um, that I'm thinking of is that in Germany, there's uh, generally in the US, we consider Europe and Germany to be leaders in uh, climate change research and um, addressing climate change. Um, and taking actions in order to slow climate change down. Um, and uh, moving to Germany, definitely, that is a difference. There, there is a bigger movement. But working as an archaeologist in a region that um, is uh, the Swabian Europe has very small towns, and most of the people in the area um, work in industry jobs. Um, like there's a big cement factory nearby. Um, they're agriculturalists, they're farmers, they're ranchers, they're sheep herders. Um, and most of these people um, fall more on the conservative side of the spectrum. And so in terms of uh, reconstructing past environments and talking about climate change, these are people that generally are politically voting for things that are less interested in climate change because they really affect their work and the way that they can work. So it was kind of interesting because I found myself in a very familiar um, environment in terms of climate change and how my research um, can discuss climate change where there's, there's very much two viewpoints because generally in academia, I would see the more progressive, or I don't want to say progressive, I want to say the more uh, leftist or liberal view that there is uh, climate change is happening and we need to do something about it. And then when I would go into the field and I'd be talking with people that we work with every day, the guy who owns the, the land that we work on and excavate on, and, and they would maybe have a different perspective that was more look this is the way <laughs> you can't change all the rules. I have to feed my family. So it was very familiar to me, um, that kind of that kind of stuff. Um, could you tell if the microfauna were eaten by humans or deposited by other means not related to the humans living in the shelter? Yes, we can. Good question. That's from Carol. Thank you, Carol. What a great question. Um, so as I said, most microfaunal remains are um, deposited as the result of these predators, non-human predators. Um, but there are examples where humans are putting rodents, especially, are eating them or doing something else with them, keeping them as pets, and they're contributing to them. There's also instances of um, uh, rodents, modern rodents, burrowing into archaeological sites, and so remains can get there from that. So if that's the case, if they're burrowing in modern guys, we can see it. There, you know, there's when you're excavating, there's a huge change in the, in the geology, in the soil, in the sediment, in the way it looks, because they're burrowing down. We usually can tell um, just in, in excavation and in the geology. Um, and then if humans are putting them there, usually what we find are, um, you can find things like tooth marks, cut marks. Um, you can find tooth marks when uh, birds are putting them there too. The cut marks are less common on rodents. We use cut marks, which is marks that are made when like butchering an animal, for example, that nick the bone and they leave a line. Um, we use those to indicate that humans 
who are butchering animals. Sometimes you can see that on rodent remains, but um, not very often. Um, but usually we'll see animals maybe that predatory birds or foxes, small mammals, that aren't interested in eating. Um, um, there was a super cool, gosh, study done. Where was that out of? You can watch and know, so you can comment. Um, about humans eating rodents and small monkeys at a site. Oh my gosh, it was interesting. I'm trying to remember what evidence they used to show this, but it was so cool. I think there were cut marks, if I remember correctly. But this is um, really uncommon. And this is something that I have to check for as the person working with the microfauna um, while I'm working to make sure that this is deposited, not by the humans there, but by something else. Um, okay. Um, does zooarchaeology also study populations of hominids prior to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis? So that's humans and Neanderthals. If so, what is the focus of these studies? Yes, we do. We, um, as archaeologists, we're studying um, humans and their ancestors um, from archaeological context, so from excavated context, for example. Um, and uh, those I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so we study all of those human ancestors as well as humans themselves. And um, we are interested in looking at the animal remains of those sites. Some of uh, the questions that we, we ask in regard to those are um, about that uh, brain size question with meat eating and when did we um, start to hunt and scavenge? Other questions we want to know were our human ancestors using eating only meat? Were they eating fish? Were they eating um, plants? Like I, like I talked about earlier, we want to know the other things that they were eating. We can also use microfauna to reconstruct past environments um, that occurred during these ancestors' time. So basically, many of the research questions that I talked about on the slides apply to our, our ancestors as well. Um, can your research indicate population size at the rock shelter? Oh, I wish. Um, so population size, I'm, I'm unsure if this question is referring to the population size of um, the microfauna at the site or if the humans of the microfauna, uh, the, the microfauna aren't living there. So I, oh, so I guess it must be the humans. So the microfauna are not living there. So I have no idea what their population size is. Um, genetics on the rodents and stuff has been done to determine population size. Not entirely sure how it works. If you're interested, I can send you a paper about it. Um, in order to determine the population size of the humans at the rock shelter, what I have done, so as part of my PhD, I studied all of the animal remains from the site. I studied the um, larger animals, as well as the microfauna. So I did um, what I refer to as the traditional zooarchaeological analysis of, um, for example, the reindeer, the horse, the cave lion, that was cool, remains at the site, as well as this microfauna to reconstruct past environments. So the traditional um, uh, zooarchaeology at the site, that's telling us about um, what the people ate, um, what decisions they were making in hunting, um, the preservation of those remains. Um, and in that respect, what I did is I compared the results of my study to a, the results of um, a big study that was done in the 1980s by um, a guy named Venegar, who looked at human settlement patterns in the Magdalenian in Central Europe and specifically did a lot of work in southwestern Germany. So basically what he did is took a lot of different archeological sites in the region, compiled their data and said, okay, the sites that have um, this many stone tools of this type, these types of animals that were hunted, uh, these types of activities that were there, maybe people were making clothing there, maybe they were storing food there, evidence for these activities. They, based on all the data combined, probably had this type of population um, versus these type of sites that had this type of population. Based on his classification, <clears throat> it looks like Langmethalda was probably a place where 
small family groups of people came together. So one family group maybe, or a couple families together. It's not a big conglomeration site. Um, it's more of a, a site that people would be using after hunting, um, living there for a short period of time. And so this is um, the way that I have looked at um, the population size of the humans at the site. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely not a precise science. And I mean, just based on the number of remains we have at the site, the size of the site, I, it's, I'm confident that it was not a large group of people. And, and I think Professor Conard would agree with me. Um, actually, I, th I think the, the whole crew would agree with me. Um, more something like a hunting camp with a, of a family group or a small group or uh, a couple small groups together. Um, okay, this is the last question I have. So it says, are there common characteristics in faunal remains from North America that show an indication of human activity long prior to the established theories? Oh. Uh, so established theories put um, human, humans entering North America, human occupation of North America at least 14,000 years ago. It, I might to be honest, I may have that date wrong just because there's, this is a hot topic right now. It may be, and if I have it wrong, it's not more recent, it's later in time. So um, 14,000 years ago, people are in the Americas. Um, is there evidence from faunal remains that it's older than this? Uh, some people say there is. I don't personally think we have enough evidence for that, but actually I am not, a uh, archaeologist uh, who's ever focused on this question. And so I'm not confident saying that it is, there is none, just because I'm not familiar with the um, faunal remains themselves. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a, actually a good question. It, if you're interested in this question, um, a, a good place to look for um, information on uh, when humans are entering the Americas. There was a really nice um, recent issue of the um, a magazine from the Society for American Archaeology that focused on this um, and had a lot of interesting uh, articles just kind of summarizing the research, which was very nice because it pointed me in the right direction of where to go since I've uh, <laughs> kind of been out of North America for a while. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not super familiar with it. Um, okay, that is all the questions that I had on here that were open still. If you have another question or I didn't answer yours, please feel free to email me or contact me via Twitter, that's totally fine, or through the center. So I've left up, excuse me, I've left up the center's um, slide here with that QR code. Use it to go to the center's website. Their website is down below as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we enjoyed having you and thank you again to Stephanie and uh, Dante at the center for inviting me to be with you guys tonight. Have a good evening. <laughs>